Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Z Learning, brought to you by Riverbanks Zoo and Garden. I am Milo, and today we are up in our botanical gardens, and I gotta be honest with all of you, we have the place to ourselves. I haven't even seen one of our horticulture staff hanging out over here. They must be hanging out behind the scenes instead. It is so peaceful and quiet. From my perspective, this is a great way to spend Earth Week, is outside, getting into nature, exploring some of those wholesome areas. All I can hear right now is the birds chirping and all of the blooms are looking beautiful today. Ella, good morning. Nice to see you for joining in. Stevie, thanks for joining in too. Vivian from Toronto and Groom, nice to see you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, we're gonna to be joined by one of my friends. Her name is Julie. She's actually one of our education specialists. And she's going to kind of pick up where Grace left us yesterday, talking about frogs and toads. But today, Julie has a little bit different of an angle. You know, yesterday we saw Rich, our southern toad friend, one of our animal ambassadors. But today, Julie actually found us some native tadpoles. And we're gonna check out those tadpoles. We're gonna slowly make our way over to the bog garden. You kind of see that we're making our way from our walled garden past Waterfall Junction. We're gonna head all the way up over to our botanical garden entrance and get started from there. Gunner and Chase, good morning. Thank you for tuning in for Z Learning. Happy Earth Week. Ella, I am so sad to hear that you missed the zoo. We miss seeing all of you too, but thank you so much for tuning into Z Learning. I cannot tell you all how much we appreciate it here at Riverbanks. Y'all have been boosting our team morale. All of our essential staff love to see the number of you tuning in on a daily basis right here for Z Learning. And today what we're gonna do is we are going to get outside and explore. Now, of course, some of you are probably tuning in from inside while you're sheltering in place, you're social distancing. I got my mask ready for when we bump into Julie on the boardwalk. But later, after today's Z-Learning feature, I want all of you to get outside. It's a beautiful day, and I want you to go out and see if you can find some of these backyard friends that we found, or maybe even make yourself an Earth Week-themed outdoor craft. Now, I say outdoor craft because obviously, we're trying to shelter in space, we're trying to limit the amount of times that we leave the house and the number of people that we interact with. So instead, we wanted to come up with an activity, a craft that had all the supplies right around your homes. So today we are going to be joined here in just a little bit by my friend Julie, but it's nice to see all of you. Good morning, Lynn, good morning, Pam. Thanks for tuning in. Like I said, today we're going to slowly make our way over to the bog garden. And from there, we're gonna talk about some of our native wildlife friends, like tadpoles, for example. But those of you who actually tuned in during our last garden feature, when we had our quick tour by Eric, you all commented in, there was a lot of comments that came in about Venus flytraps and other carnivorous plants. Well, Julie has quite the treat to show you. So we're gonna see in just a second where she might take us. But I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my mask so that way I am ready to greet Julie. She already has her mask on. Had to get my leopard spots on for <laughs> Earth Week this week. So thank you all so much. Let's go ahead and turn around this camera and say good morning to my friend Julie. Hey Julie, nice to see you. So Julie is one of our education specialists and she actually has a focus in nature play and mainly in preschool programming. Some of you actually might actually come to our nature play preschool, but Julie, you have a friend with you today. Let's go ahead and get a closer look. While I was waiting for you this morning, Milo, I found a caterpillar. If you can Hopefully see y'all can see. Take a look inside that jar. That caterpillar's hanging out yeah. on that leaf Great camouflage, if you ask me, Julie. Both Absolutely. of them are very green. And actually, I was making some crafts to share with you and did not see him for probably an hour. He was curled up in this leaf uh, before <laughs> I finally noticed him. Uh, and this, you could call him an inch worm because he is about an inch long. Uh, it's a canker worm. So eventually, this caterpillar will turn into a little brown moth. Very cool. Now, of course, that transformation has a while before that starts. Yep. So right now we'll refer to him as an inchworm friend. But even though Julie found this individual today, collected him up, 
this is a backyard friend that some of you might find in your own areas. We encourage you to get outside and explore yesterday and we're gonna do again today. But of course, Julie, we're not gonna keep this friend. Absolutely not. We're gonna let him go right back here where I found him. That sounds like a perfect idea. So we'll go ahead and unscrew the top. <laughs> and let him crawl out whenever he's ready. And then I will come back for the jar later on. That sounds perfect. So no hostages here this morning. Nope. We just get a quick up close encounter, of course is. safely. Here, let's see if we can get a little better view. There's that inchworm friend, <laughs> you can see it right inside, but we're gonna let that individual go out at their own pace. But you know what, Julie, I want you to go ahead and lead the way. We're gonna follow you, of course, while we social distance six feet away. <laughs> And we're going to head down the boardwalk because you were actually pointing out to me a couple of different plant species here just a second ago. And one of them is right here. Go ahead, tell me a little bit more about these leaves that we're looking at right now. Right. Well, this is a sweet gum tree. So uh, it's actually a very common tree around South Carolina. Uh, it has those star shaped leaves and it makes a spiky ball uh, called a sweet gum ball that you may have seen around the forest floor. Uh, but what a lot of people may not know about this tree is that it has a substance in its leaves and bark and seeds that is actually a main ingredient in a flu medicine. So No kidding. Absolutely. So uh, a lot of our medicines come from plants and trees, which is one good reason to take care of our forests. Well, how relevant too. So the next yes. time you see one of those sweet gum balls that sometimes I end up stepping on barefoot in my own yard. Yes. <laughs> this so, is probably familiar with all yeah. of you. <laughs> so the next time you have the unfortunate uh, experience of stepping on a sweet gum ball, just remember to thank the tree for making us medicine. Absolutely. Everything has a purpose out in nature. I'm so glad you stopped to show us that sweet gum plant. So look for those big kind of star pattern leaves. And then of course those sweet gum balls as well. All right, Julie, what else do we have to... Well, another thing oh, I wait noticed, a second, right here. Yeah, right here uh, is a kind of an old, kind of falling apart blossom of the tulip poplar tree. How pretty. Uh, we don't normally get to see the blossoms because they're way up high in the tree and the tulip poplar is one of the tallest trees in our southeastern forest. It can be about 200 feet tall. Whoa, so and 200 feet tall. This is a tulip poplar and it looks like about so 200 the, feet tall. Yep, the, <laughs> the blossoms when they're beautiful, when they're first blooming or when they're in the tree, they actually do look like a tulip blossom a little bit. Wow. Uh, but it's actually in the magnolia family. It's not really a poplar. How pretty. So it's kind of misnamed. We there. just had somebody tune in by the name of Jeff Flowers. What a perfect time to tune in as we're checking out one of our own favorite blooms right here at Riverbanks. <laughs> yeah, now, it, I was going to say, we're not going to get a great view, but right now we are here in our boardwalk taking a look into the canopy. But we were deposited with one of those beautiful tulip poplar yeah, blooms. The wind was nice enough to blow one down for us. It was a perfect timing today to <laughs> explore for Z learning. All right, Julie, I'll let you keep leading the way down the boardwalk. All right, we definitely want to get over to see the star of this. Absolutely. Today. I was going to say, people are on the edge of their seats. They heard about the tadpoles. It is that time of year, especially for us down here in sunny South Carolina. It's a beautiful day. Both Julie and I are in t shirts, and it is plenty warm enough out for those amphibian friends. You remember Grace yesterday talking all about their calls? Well, their calls are for a very particular reason and it is to make tadpoles. <laughs> that is one of the main reasons why they would call. So Julie, let's go ahead and head on over. We have the plaza to ourselves. Let's take a quick little peek around as we head through. It's all ours this morning. Well, all ours and all 400 of you this morning. <laughs> so thanks for tuning in for Z Learning. But what Julie did actually before we got started here this morning is she actually safely collected up a handful, I would say a good bit, of native tadpoles for y'all to get a closer look at. So let's Absolutely. go ahead and take a peek. Now, I don't know if you can see in the bug. Let's take a look. Those are a lot of little tadpoles down there in the water. There went one. I was going to say, they're not moving around a whole lot, but look for those kind of black dots with yep. little pokey tails. That's my very basic des description of a tadpole this morning. For all of you tuning in, hopefully you can get a good view of them. But like I said, Julie actually did us a big favor, and she actually so we collected them up. Even closer look here, the tadpoles 
are gonna be the little guys. They usually hang out around the bottom and they look like little baby fish, but they have a fatter body and a they skinny really do. tail. Oh, good question that just came in. Man Mandy was wondering what kind of tadpoles are they? Ah, that is a good question. Well, these are southern toad tadpoles. So wait a second, hold on. <laughs> southern toads? Yes. Which means that all of you that tuned in yesterday for Z Learning, you remember Rich the Southern Toad? Same species, just a different point in their life before the big metamorphosis. That's right. So these guys can grow up to look like Rich one day, hopefully. Wow. So this, oh, there goes one. <laughs> so these truly are a great example of backyard friends. So even though those of you who were commenting back yesterday for rich of the other southern toads, you notice that southern toads typically hang out on land, typically in drier places. But as you can tell, they're really dependent on good, clean water. Even though this water might look a little murky, it's very fresh and clean for the tadpoles. Absolutely. This is if, where they start their life. Uh, tell if, us more. Uh, well, I know Grace mentioned yesterday that uh, frogs are a good indicator of water quality. So if there were chemicals or other icky stuff in the water, these little guys would not be able to live in it. And you might also notice some tiny little creatures kind of wiggling around Ooh, yeah. at the top. Those are mosquito larvae. Oh wow, not okay, so yet. maybe not a big fan favorite over I there, know but they play an important role, don't they? They do, actually. They're not a favorite of us because <laughs> they like to bite us and make us itch, but they are an important food source for a lot of animals. The adult mosquitoes, of course, are eaten by birds and bats uh, and fish and frogs, and uh, a lot of aquatic animals will eat these little baby mosquitoes living in the water. Talk about the circle of life. That yeah. it, everyone thing really does play a role, whether it's a sweet gum tree, a mosquito larvae, or even the little tadpoles. Yeah. Linda just actually asked a question of what zoo did they come from? Well, these tadpoles actually were found right here in one of our fountain systems at Riverbanks. So what Julie and I are going to do here in a second after we continue to get our good look, Julie's actually going to release them over here in our bog area so that way they can continue to grow and develop and eventually reach maturity into a southern toad like we saw yesterday. Absolutely. So southern toads are one of our, our wild inhabitants that uh, roam around the zoo. We have a lot of them in our forest here and so we will find their tadpoles uh, in pretty much all of our fountains and our ponds out here. Uh, now these tadpoles uh, at this age they are herbivores so that means they are going to be eating plants and algae that they find in the water. But as they get bigger, they will start <laughs> to grow some legs. First come their hind legs and then their front legs and then their tails shorten. And at that point, they're going to start eating a lot of these mosquito larvae. So we definitely want to keep our waters clean so those guys can do their job and keep those mosquito larvae in check. What a great Earth Week message. We had a question in, coming in from Delaney. How long do they stay tadpoles before oh, they become a frog? That is a great question. So most of them, it will take about 30 to 55 days for the tadpole to go through the complete change. We have a really big word for that, metamorphosis. Whew. Uh, yeah, so a complete metamorphosis just means that the baby looks different from the adult and that's the same with the caterpillar that will turn into a butterfly or a moth and then our tadpoles that will turn into either a frog or a toad that's funny you must have completely planned that i didn't even think about that that is two great examples of animals that have two very different appearances depending on how old they are but amazing to think that an animal like this these little tadpoles that are swimming around can take just as long as 30 to 50 some days to transform into a completely different looking animal. Yeah. Now, we really appreciate all those questions, but you know what, Julie, I think it is time. We need to release these kiddos back out into the bigger bog area. Absolutely. I'll go ahead and take a step back right. and I'll let Julie get to it. And what we're gonna do, so to give you a better view of our bog area, we kind of have our pitcher plants that are hanging out over on the shoreline. And then typically where the waterfall would be, 
would be over in the back. But Julie went ahead and crawled on over. Let's see if we can get a closer view past these pitcher plants. So I'm just gonna gently kind of turn this sideways. I don't want to dump them and, you know, a nice smooth way. transition yep. back into their new home. Gonna put them, uh, we got a mosquito hanging out there. <laughs> Hopefully he won't bite one of us while we're talking. Hopefully. But, uh, so now they are back free swimming in the bog area. Let's see if we can get a closer view. I'm actually going to sneak on over, closer over to the right hand side to see some of those other tadpoles that Julie was pointing out a second ago. You can kind of see them hanging out near the rocks. Thankfully these individuals don't look like they have a ton of predators. But at this size and at this age, they'd be a delicious snack for quite a few different species. Julie, can you give us an example of an animal that might like to snack on a tadpole? Oh, absolutely. Uh, turtles, fish, birds. Unfortunately, a lot of things would love to eat these guys, um, which is why the mother frog made so many eggs to give them a better chance of making it. Absolutely. And that's very similar. What was it last week when we talked about our sea turtle friend? It's very similar when they have such a big clutch size with all those eggs, similar to tadpoles. Was it, it was Alexis age 12 was wondering, do you think we can find tadpoles in our neighborhood pond? I absolutely, absolutely. bet you can, especially this time of year. You bet. This is the good time to be looking for them. Uh, and actually in the next couple of months, you'll be able to find more and more and, you're and what a perfect week to get on out during Earth Week, explore, and check to see, go see if you can find your own tadpole backyard friends. Now, Julie, we have all these beautiful blooms over here. I would love yes. for you to tell us a little bit more about them. And what I are we looking at? I would love to tell you about them. These are uh, pitcher plants, which is a carnivorous plant, and it is a native plant in South Carolina. Uh, and these plants, as the name might suggest, they will eat meat. They, <laughs> they are a meat-eating plant. Uh, they like to eat bugs. And the way they do that, let's see if we can kind of get a look at this oh, one Oh, sure. Here. Let's has go ahead a, and zoom on in. Here, I'm going to go ahead back up over here you and can get a better angle. see that has a little opening there. So this is actually the leaf of this plant. The roots are down in the ground and sometimes they will be covered with water. Uh, but the leaves make this little tube uh, that the insects will fall down into and there's some sticky stuff inside. So they are not able to get out when they do that. And the hood here is actually brightly colored to attract yeah. those flies and things that it wants to eat. Uh, and it also helps keep the rain from filling up in there. <laughs> and uh, becoming too much of a pitcher, a full absolutely. pitcher. Absolutely. <laughs> so these plants grow in boggy, swampy areas where they can't get the nutrients that they need from the soil. So they've developed the ability to get those nutrients from bugs. But they do still need some friendly bugs to pollinate them. So what they've done is they've put their flowers way up above the trap. Wow. So that is one of the blooms so that way there. they don't trick some of those good yeah. friendly pollinators that so they, they want to work with. They don't want to eat the bees. They really want to eat flies, beetles, ants, any other bug that isn't going to be a pollinator for them. Uh, some of them will even smell a little stinky Ooh. to attract. Thank goodness I don't smell them this morning. Our masks are kind yeah, of filtering we'd have, it. <laughs> we'd have to get close and take our masks off. Um, but, yep, yeah, so that they will attract the flies that are attracted to those stinkier things. Well, and Julie actually has a great kind of um, a demonstration that she has for us, too. I'll go ahead and kind of pass it on over to her. Oh, sure. Um, but Ven actually just commented in, Ven, age eight, can carnivorous plants be dangerous to humans? Not at all. Thankfully, no, that's not the case. So not we are safe. We are not going to get trapped inside of those pitchers. But those of you who've tuned in before and you were wondering about Venus fly traps and pitcher plants, these are all kind of in that same general idea of plants that are carnivorous, that need more nutrients, and actually rely on eating meat but julie actually those of you who wanted a bigger view yeah, so has a great demo here this is an awesome puppet that one of our volunteers handmade for us uh and it just gives you a closer look at how those leaves make that big tube so you can see that bright that color on the back yep and the hood there that the fly would be drawn to and then this is going to be sticky around here and as it goes in there uh, it also has these little hairs that will kind of keep pulling it down all the way down to the bottom. And that's where what they it digest. Consumes it. 
it, kind of like you consume your food. So I will say, those of you who are wondering, what are we looking at right now? This is a larger than life demonstration. It Don't is. worry, picture plants are not this big, at least not here. In fact, we're looking at, Pam was just wondering what species. We have yellow pitcher plant, pitcher plant. These are all native yeah. South Carolina species. This is a Dixie lace over there with the big flowers. Uh, that's actually a, a double bloom. That's um, beautiful. So you notice here in our botanical gardens, we have all these great signs. Our horticulturalists and our registrar do a great job of organizing all the names, scientific and common. So when we do reopen from our temporary closure, make sure to kind of check out not only the signs and interpretive graphics all around where our animals live, but also our plants too. You might recognize some familiar faces from Z-Learning. Yeah. And while we're here, I do have to give a shout out to one of our gardeners, Penny. This is her area. Uh, she's worked very hard for the past two years on these pitcher plants, dividing them and caring for them. And this is the first time that these pitcher plants have bloomed. So it's a pretty wow. big deal. Well, so I'm so glad go, that Penny. we could, way to go Penny is right. I'm so glad we could bring it all to you live here on Facebook this morning. What a great time of year to kind of take a peek at all these blooms. Now, even though you might not have pitcher plants in your own backyard, maybe it's not boggy enough or moist enough in those areas around your house, keep your eyes peeled for other blooms. In fact, Julie, I think you have one last surprise for us ah. that kind of involves some flowers, some backyard crafts. Let's go ahead, head on over. All right. I'll let you lead the way. Like I said before, we have the place to ourselves. So we went ahead and set up across the plaza over here. We'll follow Julie on over because like I said, when we were starting this morning over on the boardwalk, not everyone can get out and about. Not everyone has a closet full of cr craft supplies. So Julie, let's use nature instead today. What do you have here? What kind of nature crafts can we do today? Uh, I did a little bit of leaf threading today and I wove in some flowers Look at and those chains. some pieces from trees that I found. Uh, and I use some vines and long grasses, everything that you can find right outside. Um, so first thing I want to point out, these are all free. You can yes. literally find them outside. You can fill up a great little basket, a Tupperware, whatever you have at home and find unique shaped leaves. I see some ginkgo leaves in there yes. as well. And what you can do, you need a base though. So, so what's a good starting spot? Uh, some really good starting spots are some vines or long grasses. And you can practice your tying skills with these. I'm gonna just wrap it around and put that through and make a little loop that I will be able to put one of uh, these lovely sprigs that I found. And I, I could also put some flowers in there. Now, one thing about collecting flowers that I have to say you want to, if you're going to use flowers, make sure that you collect them from an area that has a lot of them. So if mm -hmm. the plant just has one or two flowers, you want to leave that alone. That might be its only chance to make seeds and make more plants. Good point. So um, these that I collected, there were quite a lot of them. So I went ahead and took just a couple. So make to sure make to leave a small footprint, let's call it that, Yes. on the natural world and leave some for the plants, even during Earth Week. Find areas that have lots of flowers while you're making these crafts. But what a great activity to get you outside. It's relaxing. Like I said, it takes hardly any resources. If you just have a container to go ahead and bring with you, you can reuse it later, bring a bowl, fill it on up. And then what you can do is you can either- Hang them in your trees or on your porch. I love that. you might wanna enjoy them. And one of the other really nice things about this craft is you can just leave it up and enjoy it until it falls apart. This is gonna be a temporary kind of art. It will eventually fall apart and go right back into nature and be recycled right where it grew. How perfect. Okay, so the parents that are tuning in today for Z-Learning, let me translate that to you. No clean up. That means that you can go ahead and do this outdoor craft weave all those things together. You can poke little holes here. I want to actually show you what Julie worked on earlier. She kind of weaved both of those leaves together using all natural materials. There's no glue, no human made materials, anything. This is all nature based and you can put them all together, hang them from your porch, from a balcony, from a tree, a bush, 
and then leave them. All right, so another technique that I use, you might have noticed with those leaves there, with these larger leaves, I can kind of break off the stem here and I can use that to connect these leaves. What I'm going to do is kind of overlap them and mm -hmm. then I'm going to poke that stem through the top of one, through the other one, and then I'm going to go down through the bottoms until I've made like two holes and kind of How simple. attach those together and then I can hang that in one of my things there if I like. I can keep going. I can make a long chain of leaves if I want to. Uh, so that's another technique that you can use. Now, the reason why Julie actually picked out this activity was obviously the availability of resources. You can find all of these, no matter how big or how small your garden or outdoor space might be at home. But another reason too, is this is for people of all ages. Julie does this on a regular basis when we are typically open with our preschool groups, with our nature-based preschool. And what I'm telling you though, everybody who is not preschool age, as I try to talk over a helicopter that's visiting us right now, <laughs> is that you can do this as well. In fact, I'm kind of thinking of maybe doing a at-home challenge later today, maybe posting some photos, seeing what kind of beautiful patterns everyone can make. In fact, those of you who are tuning in right now, I want you to start getting some good ideas. Julie gave you some great examples here at the Botanical Gardens today. And I want you to post some pictures of those in our caption later. I wanna see what kind of nature-based crafts y'all ended up doing in your own spaces at home. All right, everybody, let's take one last look at those beautiful weavings here. Let me go ahead and turn this around so you can see that great example. Get back into nature. It's so peaceful out here, especially once the helicopters have passed. <laughs> All I can hear now is the birds again. It's a great way to celebrate Earth Week, but I have to go ahead and give a big thank you to Julie. Thank you so much, Julie, for joining us this morning. Thank you, Milo. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We All right, everybody. Seeing you again soon. Absolutely. Hopefully sooner rather than later, everybody. Let me go ahead and turn around this camera because I wanted to go ahead and remind you to not only get outside during Earth Week this week, but explore, get some fresh air, go ahead and make a nature-based craft just like Julie showed us a second ago. But I also wanna have on your radar tomorrow morning to join us live at 10 a.m. We are going to be starting our Z-Learning adventure from Siamang Island for a very special snack with our two Siamangs. We'll see if they're loud and noisy like they typically are or a little quiet and hungry. We'll decide tomorrow at 10 a.m. And then from there, you're going to join me for a zoo-wide adventure. I want you to send us your ideas later on in a Siamang video that we'll post this afternoon. And I wanna hear where we should go for our Earth Day adventure to celebrate 50 years of Earth Day. Until next time, everybody, join us tomorrow morning for Z-Learning. Bye-bye.